Welcome to this edition of Americana Station. I'm India Ramey, and I am here with David Newball to talk about his recently released album, Power Up. David, it's so nice of you to join me, and I'm really excited about talking about this awesome rockin' album. Well, thanks. I'm glad to be here. I was um, at the album release, um, sort of like by chance, I guess. <laughs> And so I had the pleasure of singing with you on stage um, at, as it was sort of a last minute serendipitous thing. And um, I had the pleasure of sitting and enjoying your album release show and rocking out to you and your band. You guys sounded great. And um, I've been listening to the album since then. And um, I just want to know how this powerhouse, if you will, um, came to be. Um, it's my understanding that you recorded it in the midst of the pandemic. So tell me some about that. So, yes, uh, early in the pandemic times, I I had this handful of songs that I'd uh, written around then and decided that uh, I wanted to just document this time and kind of make a record with a lot of the songs I'd written since pandemic and a few earlier ones that you know, kind of fit with them. I thought that I'd kind of been sitting waiting for a home for. So I demoed them all uh, acoustically and put a whole album together just on GarageBand. And uh, then I wasn't sure who I was going to approach to sort of produce it and do it with. And um, um, I was over at Scott Sachs's one day, our kids, uh, my son's about the same age as his two girls. So they were having a play date. And uh, he came down with his bass and he said, he said, OK, so uh, we went to take my TV in yesterday to the shop and the guy kept plugging it in. He said, it won't power up. It won't power up the TV. So I don't know. What do you think? Should we do it? And uh, <laughs> said, OK, let's see what happens. <laughs> so uh, he had his bass and his amp over his shoulder and and or his bass over his shoulder and his amp. And he starts playing this bass line and we just kind of wrote this thing really fast and we each kind of wrote a verse and we came up with a chorus and we jammed for about 20 or 30 minutes. He was playing the drums and I was just playing guitar, trying to come up with sort of a riff for it. And we were recording it. And then eventually the kids had had enough playtime. So it was time to leave. And he just kept sending me uh, new sort of edits of this song. And, and eventually we kind of came to what ended up on the record. But I wasn't thinking it was going to be a record or anything. We were just kind of having fun. Yeah, And it came out so cool and so like interesting and different and creative than anything I would have done, you know, on my own that I thought I just said, hey, well, this pandemic's on and neither of us are doing anything. So how can we make a record? Like I got all these songs. I want to make a record. He said, yeah, that sounds like fun. So we set up his studio, his, his garage and put a, a window pane and we kind of like divided it in half and put a pane of glass between us. And we spent about the next, I don't know, three or four months on either side of the glass just chipping away and making this record mostly just the two of us and um we had a few guest people come in and i brought my band in one day and we did a session outdoors in his driveway um but it was real sort of uh, off the cuff in terms of how we were doing it and i i didn't know we were gonna i didn't know if i was gonna put it out or what like i just kind of wanted to do it mm -hmm. and so we were really creatively just kind of being free and just trying to make it sound you know, as cool as the records that we liked, you know, that we've been listening to our whole lives. And uh, yeah, and then it just kept going. And then we got some momentum and then Blackbird got involved and then and then it just kind of came to be. Tell me, um, besides you and Scott, who all played on the album? Uh, Kristen Weber uh, played violin on on one song. Mm -hmm. uh, B. Taylor uh, sang backup vocals on one song. Mm -hmm. Um, my drummer, Dave Colella plays on one song. We had sessions for more, but we had a mishap with the hard drive and some tracks got lost. So uh -huh. we would have done more. Same with Tim Denbo, who was playing bass with me then. And then Dill Stevie came to hang out one day and he ended up playing drums on two songs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think that's it. And then, um, Sorry, what's that? I was going to say, what I love about this is like, you know, whenever the lockdown happened to all of us, um, I mean, I don't 
I don't know about you, but I like, I was like a deer in the headlights. Like I thought I was like, is, you know, is this the day the music died? Mm. You know, <laughs> Like, how are we going to do this? Like, how are we going to um, continue with this and still create? And I, I'm just so heartened by the stories like yours where, you know, music found its way and the, and the creative people and the musicians found their way to still be able to create in this like dystopian <laughs> situation uh, we're all in. I mean, like, f- you know, figuring out how to put a window pane where y'all aren't, you know, like spitting on each other <laughs> and stuff like that. Like I, I applaud, um, I applaud you for finding a way to do that. Well, thanks. Yeah. Don't you feel like I feel, I mean, when it first started, I thought, well, one of the things that'll be cool to come out of this is all the beautiful new ways that people will uh, uh, create and get things done. And as time went on, it seemed like, well, I don't know how beautiful it is. I mean, people did lots of live streaming and, and sort of bridge the gap as best they could. But at the end of it, I just sort of think like, I don't think anything really beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had higher hopes, I guess, for some sort of uh, lofty goals of what we all might uh, pull off for the future. But I think, on the whole, I think I'm 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 uh, impressed and proud of how everybody just sort of to bridge the gap. That's the best. Way. Yeah, like I I feel you. I like I had the same. I kind of had the same thing. Like I was, you know, after I got over like the deer in the headlights moment, I was like, okay, this is this is where everything changes and it's going to be this great, like transformative thing. And um, I'm going to get like, I'm going to be a shredder on the guitar by the end of this year, (laughs) (laughs) all this stuff. And, and like, I I think I I hit a midway point somewhere. Like, I think I really did write a bunch of great stuff that is still yet to go out in the world. And, um, you know, good things did come out of it. But I think like in retrospect, I have to look back and say, like, also, you know, we were we were creating great things like the album that you made. But we were also doing it simultaneously with coping with the trauma of Mm. of, you know, being thrust into a pandemic lockdown situation. Like when we were kids, we never thought we were going to be in something like this. So, you know, the fact that we were able to create under those conditions, I think is miraculous in and of itself. Yeah. I think for about six months, Scott might've been one of the only adults I actually saw, like other than my wife and, you know, (laughs) the guys came over for a a, a driveway session. And yeah, I, uh, it was hard. It was just, all of it's been hard and it's, it's, uh, I don't know. I feel like, I sort of feel like societal energy was just kind of moving along for hundreds and thousands of years and everything was just building on top of one thing or another. And it was all just like this train and some parts of the train were good and some not so good, but it was all connected. And then I just feel like it stopped. It just hit this wall. And now, and now everything's open again and people are going out and it feels to me like it's all got to start up, start over. It's sort of like got to pick up in the eighth inning where you're just learning how to throw and hit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's going mean, to, everything opens up, but it still feels like it's, it's going to be a while. I don't know. I feel like we're kind of in that, you know, that scene in Austin Powers where he's like on that um, little motorized cart or whatever. And he like tries to turn around and he's having to do it like inch by inch to get turned around. He's like, uh-uh, uh-uh. <laughs> that's right. That's what I feel like humanity. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's like right now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, all of that being said, tell me how much of that like played into the writing and the, the material that, that you placed on this piece of work. Uh, A few saw the songs that, uh, I mean, there were a few songs directly to do with it, particularly the last two on the record called uh, Sunrise Surprise and Digging In. They, they both, to me, were kind of came from that place of just sort of serious uh, isolation and, 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 well, just kind of 
wonderment as to what i don't know just being kind of discombobulated and lost and what on earth do we like hold on to like where do we look for stuff and what like nothing's nothing's uh you can't trust anything because like what what's what's going on here you know what yeah. i mean um yeah. what can you count on and uh so i was just i was i was i was just feeling well you just kind of look around and what you see in front of you and when everything's pushed out away from you what actually is there immediately whether it be your family or your home or your relationship with an instrument or your your memories or your potential hopes of things that can happen when it all starts up and just kind of just take stock and huddle up and just one foot in front of the other and so that was kind of a lot of it and then I grabbed some songs that I'd written in the past that I felt connected to those sort of themes too and yeah yeah if you had to I I mean it might not like sometimes sometimes albums can't be summed up or whatever but it, is there an overall theme um that kind of like reson like that sort of pulls everything together and binds it together in in this album I think it's kind of about going down a hole and looking for bright spots to pull yourself up with. Yeah. Would be the best, the best way yeah. to sum it up. Like I purposely want to end it on a softer yet slightly optimistic place. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, I think it's fairly dark, but it, you know, um, we tried to have fun with it too. I mean, the recording, I was actually really fun. I mean, we actually had yeah. a good time because we just let loose. And, uh, and, um, so I don't know. That's the thing. Like, like it, I, I know that it was like created during a dark time and there are some, you know, dark themes that, that you're dealing with in it, but it doesn't feel, um, super dark to me. Like I, I feel that optimism, um, that sort of optimism undercurrent going through the whole thing too. I think it's just, um, uh, processing, you know, like, I think that's the way it came across to me was that it's just like kind of, um, translated into just the human experience of processing big things. (laughs) Right. Which is sort of what goes on all the time anyway, isn't it? But it's more amplified now, I guess. Yeah. There's, There's one song I did want to put on there that I'd had sitting around for a long time called one last dance that's something i wrote several years back about about just being surrounded here in nashville and well in a lot of the places i've lived you know like yourself you surround yourself generally with other artistic minded people Mm -hmm. you know striving for things and you know dedicating their lives to these you know mathematically ridiculous goals (laughs) 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 and uh um and and there's a bond i feel like there's a bond between the people that know each other doing it and the people even that you don't know and and i and i was and one one day i was just sitting around just kind of struck by by how many like-minded folks um we were surrounded by just working hard at things songwriters and um so i wrote the song kind of about that and about that and i really felt in this particular time when you know everything just has to stop that I really kind of wanted to record that finally and put it sort of as a homage to people like you and me and Will and everybody we know just working mm-hmm. and being, you know, you're already trying to push a, a you know, a rock up a steep hill and yeah. now it's like, okay, you can't push the rock. You just have to lay here at the bottom under this rock and wait till, you know, you're able to start trying to push this rock up the hill again. Yeah. <laughs> I sort of like take breaks from it and then push again and then take breaks. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a really good, it's a really good metaphor. Um, you, that, you know, there might be a song in that, you know. <laughs> um, t- tell me about the title track to powered up. I mean, like, you know, you mentioned that it was sort of born out of this television situation. Mm-hmm. Was there like some other stuff that you worked into it thematically um, like, you know, like my song snake handler is about like 
you know, snake handling churches, but there's a bunch of like other themes in it about like the snakes in your head and things like that. So was there stuff that worked into powered up like that? Well, uh, kind of, uh, it, yeah. I mean, it, it was sort of impetus came from the TV and the, and the, and the, and the chorus was just one word or yeah. two words is power up, power up. And, uh, so we each kind of wrote a verse and, uh, you know, my verse, uh, well, it was, uh, I look at the world. I want to see my place. I look in the mirror. I want to see my face. I look at my hands. I want to get the job done. I'm thinking Mount Olympus, but I see the setting sun. It's going down every night of the week. I open up my mouth, but I can hardly speak. I got to power up, you know, so I just. I love uh, that. Thanks. So, so I try to, yeah, I just made it a bit more of the, uh, more than just trying to plug a TV in, I guess. Just trying to like plug yeah. your soul, yeah. trying to plug your soul in trying to keep it plugged in hell yeah <laughs> like, the the doctor tells you plug your soul in yeah power up. <laughs> awesome. it's like we caught it he he sang the first verse like we were just gonna we were thinking we'd put it out you know as like scott sax and david newbold just a song you know and then once the st- record started we sort of said why don't you just sing the whole thing and put it on the record that's a good idea so but his first was uh what was his um um spacing on it right now but I, you know it was kind of more universal too <laughs> yeah so, yeah I, th- I think it was i think i think it, and it, it just felt like this is a time where we we're gonna all need to, to power up and uh because this will be over and you're gonna have to plug back in <laughs> you kind of gotta stay you kind of need to hover need around that socket right now anyway because you know you can't just if you just leave something unplugged for too long it's not gonna you know try to start a car after it's been sitting in the driveway for six months it's not gonna start yeah you know yeah yeah no i I think that's another beautiful metaphor um that that uh really resonates super uh, super big with me um i want to talk about ready for the times to get better for a second (laughs) <laughs> Cause I don't, I, you probably don't know this, but I did a cover of that song on my very first album that I did. ever did. And I love that song. That song got me through a divorce. It got me through some, my move to Nashville. Like it, it has been um, kind of a, kind of like if I was in a movie, that would be kind of a theme song that would mm-hmm. kind of follow me through that movie. And I love your version of it. And I love, um, listening to what how it came out through you you know with the 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 fiddle on it is super haunting and it's like it's totally different from you know where I put it um but it's it's gorgeous to see what somebody else with did with it and I want to ask you how how did how did you what made you decide to do that cover well the way I kind of got clued into that song uh is not the most romantic story i mean uh, the 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 person who who publishes alan reynolds who wrote the song is a friend of mine matt lindsay and pre right before <laughs> the pandemic he uh we were talking about um maybe uh them getting behind a record my next record and <laughs> also cutting some songs of some of their writers. So he, he just told me some, like we just started talking about songs over the phone and he, and I wrote a bunch of them down that he was talking about. And that was one. And I listened to it and I realized I had heard it, but it had been a very long time. Mm -hmm. And, and the plan never happened, you know, pandemic came and everything just shut down and that was over. But I, I kept, I kept that. I, I, I couldn't let go of that song. And as soon as everything just kind of went down, it just, it just really connected with me, that song. So I, uh, I just said, well, I I just want to record this anyway. And also like power up, I I cut it. We we could, we just, we put it out as a single earlier, uh, like last year. Mm -hmm. Um, because I want, I just want to put it out in the middle of that time. And, uh, yeah, well, it's just, you know, I don't know why that's, I don't know why everybody doesn't know that song. I mean, it's I don't like, either. And, and I love Crystal Gale too. Like, yeah. I mean, when I was a little girl, I used to watch her on solid gold and I Give wanted to solid gold. <laughs> her hair going down the stairs, yeah. you know, like bumping on the stairs as she walked down. And I just thought 
I was like, she's a goddess. And, um, that, that is like one of my, not only my favorite Crystal Gale song, but one of my all time favorite songs. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Um, and I like Alan probably mad at me a little bit because whenever I recorded it, I added some lyrics to the chorus because I like I felt like I needed something else there. So I like don't tell him I did that. <laughs> but I love that song. And um I remember one time I tweeted, I tweeted a uh like this the um Spotify link to it or something, and I tagged Crystal Crystal Gale in it. And she started following me on Twitter and I like called my mom and like, I was like, Crystal Gale, follow me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was just, all of that being said, I just was, I really enjoyed that you had chosen to, to do that song. And I really, I love your version of it. It's quite beautiful. Thank you. We, uh, we, we cut it very simply. Um, Scott set up a, a, a a big kick drum and a snare on the wall. So he was like hitting him like this. And I was in the behind the pane of glass and I actually couldn't see him. So I didn't even know he had set him up like that until after. Wow. And, and uh, I was just playing acoustic guitar and, and, and uh, singing and he did the drums and we just cut, cut it live in one, one take. And, uh, and, uh, and it, you know, it's like, it's such a simple song in terms of its arrangement and its, mm-hmm. and its structure and i wanted to i wanted to record it that simply because i just feel like you know you put like the work is already done i mean it's already great you could just play it on one string on a ukulele and not be a good <laughs> singer and not be able to play ukulele well and it would still be great you know <laughs> yeah. what i mean yeah so, wanted to go not much further than that <laughs> And then we put bass and then the only thing missing was something. And I tried playing some get- electric guitar and it just wasn't happening. And then we thought we need to ask Kristen Weber. She put some violin on here and that was it. That was all the color it needed. Dark. It's, it's beautiful. It's it's dark, but it, like the thing that I love about that song and what you did with it is it's a dark song, but it has so much of like that warrior energy into it. Like it's, it's optimistic too. Like, it's like, I am, I am going to shake loose of this and I am going to get on the other side. Right. Cause it goes to the major chords and the chorus and it just really like Springsteen-y type. Mm. Yeah. It gives, it gives me chills talking yeah. about it. <laughs> <laughs> so kudos to you for, uh, yeah, for, for making that, what's already a beautiful song shine, you know, even brighter. Um, well, thanks. I, I gotta think, listen to your version now. I think it's that. beautiful. Mine's like, mine's like ramped up and fat. Like mine's really angry. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was probably, you know, channeling some, some anger when I was recording it. So it's, it's a little bit more punk rock, I guess. <laughs> Um, so I, let's see, I wrote down another, okay. I love Peeler Park. Thanks. Tell me, tell me about Peeler Park. That, uh, so, well, I live on uh, Peeler Park's at the end of my road. So let me just adjust this for a second. I'm sorry. You're good. Mike stand no matter how tight i twist this knob it it falls no matter how slowly it falls you have to like I'll finish it take and look over and it's sitting down here um <laughs> okay so uh well i my last record I, I was listening to i would go over and over the running order i really obsess about probably unimportant things like running order on albums so i would just drive around night after night after night listening to the album in different orders and often i would just drive down my road to peeler park and back and back and forth because it's probably about a 10 or 15 minute drive from from my house to go all the way down there Mm -hmm. and uh you know like at night it's a pretty desolate place there's it's it's basically just an opening to a nature trail but then there's a there's a ramp down into the river um and uh i would just sit there and then drive back and then one time there was a guy just sitting there in his car 
by himself. It's probably two or three in the morning. And I, I started thinking about, you know, I wonder what his story is. And I thought, well, if that was me, I mean, I, I just, and it, it just kind of like opened a door, I guess, um, to, uh, to like struggling with depression and things like that. And, and, and just being out, being out in the world and just like facing, facing these things that a lot of people, you know, like can't really cope with them until they can face them. And, and, uh, and every day can be a struggle. You have to face these things and then go back home and you, and, and you have to be the, you know, you, you want to be a complete version of yourself a complete version of yourself around the people you love, you know, which, you know, for some people is hard. Mm -hmm. A lot of people is hard. And, um, and so people need an outlet. And uh, so I sort of, I sort of, uh, I sort of wrote it like as if something down at Peeler park, like going down there in the middle of the night was the outlet and just, and just trying to think of things and think of hard things, but then try to think of, good things and the guy being able to sort of go back home mm -hmm. and uh it's, it's it, that, that's really what it's about that song i think it's a really gorgeous song and um it's got i mean it's it's a rocking song but it's got like so many like beautiful elements and it it's very moving so mm -hmm. um so i i really enjoyed that the other one that that i really thought was super killer was blood on my hands. Mm. Um, like that. I, I like kind of like minor cordish dark stuff anyway. So like you had me at that, but, but I think that the melody on the chorus on that one too, is just like superb. And um, I kind of want to talk about that song a little bit too. If, if you, if you can tell me about that one. I, I wrote that um, the day after um they started uh, detaining the, the kids at the border just for the purpose of, of acting as a deterrent rather than, uh, you know, because their family had done something actually criminal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just so angry and I felt like, well, there's officially blood on, on this guy's hands now. And so I wrote, I just wrote the verses in the chorus. And then that's another one that sat around for a while. I didn't really have an arrangement. I just thought, I don't know. I don't, I don't uh, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I'm not the type of form to go out there on a soapbox and, 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 uh, you know, like I wish I was, I wish I was, uh, James McMurtry or someone that, you know, when he comes up with a song like that, he, he, he'll go out and make it his mission to let everybody know where he stands, which is great. Uh, maybe at another point in my life I was, but I, I, um, I just like to put in the songs if, if it's there. So I did, I, I wrote that song and I, and I kind of got the anger down on paper mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I wanted to cut it. The things just kept happening. And I just thought, I'm just too angry. I just, I just want to cut the song. And um, so it had like a train beat originally, but um, again, Scott, Scott's a very primitive drummer. It's wonderful. Like he can do a lot of things, but, you know, he really likes to come home to Ringo stuff and, and just, I, I don't know. He just started doing this bump, blah, blah, bump, blah. And I just, wow, that really spoke to me. So it just brought the whole thing up to another level and um, made it feel as angry as um, I was when I wrote it. And yeah. uh, so, you know, it's really, it's really about anybody who just thinks they can get away with anything um, because they think they're greater than anybody else. And as long as they just tell people they're a certain way and people believe it, if they want to believe it mm -hmm. and you know, who's the world to stop them. All right. I mean, right. He's not the only guy with a messianic complex like that, you know? Yeah. They're um, out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was definitely directly about that. Well, I really, I, I really like that song. I think it's probably my favorite on the album. Um, I think it's just beautiful from start to finish. And um, I think it's, you know, really important for us to take on subject matters like that too. Cause you know, it is, I, I feel it's it definitely that's, that's the purpose of art and writing and, 
and and doing songs is when you feel something like that you know you need to you need to commit it to the thing that you do you know yeah and uh it's just so hard i mean everybody's especially now with social media just everybody's got an opinion everybody knows everybody's opinion and after a while it can just be overwhelming to know where everybody stands on every, on everything you know yeah um <laughs> Um, it's good in a lot of ways. First, I don't know what it's just such a huge thing, but I definitely feel like it's your duty as an artist to at least write about these things and put them into the, the art form that you work through. And, I completely uh, agree. I, I, um, I, I always, I always ask the, the shut up and sing crowd, you know, like, um, you know, if, if you want me to shut up and sing, like, well then, you know, don't, to, uh, don't shuffle around in your loafers and do your white man's overbite to CCR anytime soon. Because <laughs> right? uh, yeah. Oh, I mean, it's like everybody could talk about it except people on a stage. I mean, do they just shut up and not talk? You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. I'm, I'm sure everyone talks about stuff with people they know, you know, and if you're, if your forum is standing on a stage, I mean, it's your workplace and you want to talk. And if people don't want to listen, then they can walk out, you know, I completely agree. I don't, I don't even have a problem with people with views. I don't like uh, doing the same thing because, you know, everyone should do that. You know, I mean, it's, it's, if they want to, you know, I think it's healthy. I think it's a healthy thing. Yeah. Okay. I just have a couple more um, questions. Um, one of them, I read that you were born in Toronto. Mm. How long did you live in Toronto? 20 years. Or so until are, I turned 20. Yeah. Are you a tragically hip fan? I think we've talked about this on the internet one time. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> it, possibly because every, like anytime I find out somebody's from Canada, I'm like, so what about the hip? Right. <laughs> <laughs> They were one of my bands in high school, no doubt. I saw them a bunch of times, and um, I, I I wouldn't say I've stayed with them over the years, um, but you know I'll always be close to that relationship I had with them in those years and those earlier records of theirs. Um, and live, man, they were just so great live. Uh, so yeah, fan for sure. I was very sad when we lost Gord Downey a few years back. Very sad. I was too. I was devastated. Um, I, I wrote a song about it um, on my most recent album. And I like, I hate it whenever I write a song that like, I like I write it and I record it and then I never want to hear it again because it's too sad. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened with that one. Like Sean was trying to play hole in the world the other night. And I was like, do not play that song. I can't. Cause oh, I just, oh, that's good. I was really just leveled by the loss of Gord Downey because um, I, I, I look up to him so much as a songwriter and, um, you know, strive to, I know I'll never be as good a writer as him, but like, I kind of like have him setting the bar for songwriting. And um, he was such a humanitarian too. He was just such a good human being. It uh, felt terrible to lose him. Well, first of all, you're a great writer, so don't say that about yourself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But um, yeah, he was, yeah, he was such an entertainer, so committed to like he just went deep. I mean, you could tell his whole life was just writing mm -hmm. and and striving for, you know, the goals that he had set for himself. Really seemed, yeah, you know, like he just he just wanted to be great and then greater you know, just keep getting yeah. better. And, uh, yeah. And he was, he was, uh, I mean, even just the way he went out, like they did that final tour knowing that he was basically going to die within about six months. And yeah. And, uh, and, uh, he gave it all uh, right to the end and, you know, everyone that knew him, so he was just a beautiful guy and soft spoken, like a lot of these people that are very extroverted on stage, but very kind of mild and soft spoken, Mm -hmm. off stage and uh he was like that and it's a testament they're one of those few bands that stayed together the same members for the whole ride 
you know, like how many of those are there? Like they all, they all seem like good buddies right to the end and believed in, you know, his vision of writing and each other. I think that, I think that the tragically hip were one of, were like that, you know, that one of these bands that stays together till the end and um, loved each other till the end um, because it like, it's so apparent that there are no egos in that band. Mm-hmm. You know, there are no, there are no soloists. There are no, like, you know, there's not, even with Gord being like a, an incredibly great front man, everything was so cooperative and so supportive from the beginning, you know, from the, the creation of the songs to the performance of the songs. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, that's another reason why I love them so much is because, um, you know, the music is the star <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> for them. Um, and like the, one of the other things that I love about the tragic clip so much is they are, they're a rock band, man. Like they, they play and make rock and roll. Mm-hmm. And that's what I love about your stuff too. Cause it's just like pure rock and roll. And we don't get enough of that these days. <laughs> well, to quote Joan Jett, I, I love rock and roll. <laughs> Yes. Yes. It's good. It is right. <laughs> yeah. I kind of came, I, I kind of came into uh, acoustic music and, and, and songwriting. Um, I started with rock and roll and then sort of evolved towards that. But the first thing I did was play drums when I was young, you know, loud and, you know, and then, uh, and then guitar, loud, you know, just rock guitar, rock and roll guitar. And and then I really started discovering, and Neil Young was kind of the bridge because he had all of it. Like, yeah, you know, like he wrote, you know, Heart of Gold and songs like that. But then he was also like a hurricane. And I, I, I knew about him, you know, I, I'd heard him on the radio. And when I, well, I was into Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix and stuff, uh, I just sort of thought he was a sort of old folky guy. And it wasn't until I saw the, uh, a guy loaned me the uh, VHS Neil Young live rust concert video. Mm-hmm. Cause he said, I think you'd like, I think you'd like this. And I watched it. And when I, when I realized, I mean, the guitar, you know, songs like, like a hurricane and Cortez, the killer and all this. And, and it just, there was definitely a shift in my life the first time I watched that. And, he sort of bridged it where I was because this, these songs were deep. I mean, there was, there was theater going on in this, in this material and in these lyrics and melodies and the, and the guitar. And, uh, and, and then from there it opened me up to, you know, Dylan and Springsteen and, you know, eventually towns and all these people, but I never left. Uh, I never, uh, something about something about rock and roll when like, fast moving loud mm-hmm. instruments you know i need it <laughs> yeah yeah i mean and i love playing solo i love playing solo shows too just with my acoustic but you know I, I i just need that full thing too it's such a powerful thing like like i'm like you too like i, I played a solo show this past saturday and it was super fun cuz like i you know i got to in those kinds of settings, I get to tell more about like what each song is about and kind of like, you know, really connect to the audience. So I love that. But like, there's just something about getting in a room with a bunch of other musicians and just going all in. And Mm. like that feeling is just, that ain't nothing but electricity right there. And I live for it. (laughs) Yeah. It's, It's a beautiful thing. Um, what's your favorite song on the album? On power? Oh, uh, if you had to pick one, uh, let me look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I know I did this with mine too. I'm like, what are, what are they? <laughs> uh, gosh, I, I, uh, probably, I would probably say p- probably Peeler Park. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe followed by last letter, um, probably those, but I, I, you know, I love all of them. What can I say? 
I know it's like trying to pick your pick your favorite child or because they're all your babies and it's hard to pick one. But I, I always like asking people that, though, just to like just to see yeah. where, you know, where it sits with you. Um, well, a Peeler, Peeler Park to, to me definitely felt like a uh, uh, what would be the word? I don't know. It felt like one of those songs when I wrote it. I said, this one's this one's a, a keeper. You know, I don't know. Like, I yeah. And uh, and uh, la- last letter is one that I've had sitting around forever for probably like seven eight years as an acoustic finger picking song in a, in a much higher key. And at some point, I thought uh, this one this one really needs to. I just need to let loose with this. And that's another one we cut in one take. Wow. Um, Dylan CV came over to hang out at Scott's, and uh, he got behind the drums. And uh, I played it once for him and for he and Tim, the bass my bass player to sort of here and they wrote the chords and they were just all right let's do we only had about 15 minutes left in the session and we said let's just do this and then just so we do it and then we can get together another day and like get it properly you know if depending on everyone's schedule mm-hmm. but it was so kind of loose and rough and it, and it, and and uh it, it it's kind of about two sisters that song I, I don't know why i wrote this story about about two sisters and one like one that's gone wrong, gone off the rails in her life. And the other one, you know, has always sort of been there trying to protect her and trying to keep, keep her own life moving at the same time. And, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it's kind of like a bit of a spooky sort of story to me. So I, I wanted this and I, <laughs> it's odd, but I wanted it to sound like, are you familiar with the uh, Bob Dylan album, uh, street legal? Uh-huh. And, and so I don't know if you're if if you have the vinyl and you open the vinyl. Well, first the front cover is just this picture of him outside this mysterious sort of place, maybe like in Portugal or somewhere, like in this old old place. And then in the inside, there's these dark two dark images on the sleeve of like just in a in a bar. You know, you don't know where it is. Maybe Morocco or somewhere. It's just really kind of mysterious and weird. You know, like 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 a lot of Bob's music. And I and I I kind of wanted it to sound like how those images look and feel to me. So that's cool. Yeah. That's really I, don't, cool. I don't know why I just, I just was equating the two in my brain and, um, and then B Taylor just nailed these amazing uh, vocals in the chorus. And so I really love that song a lot. That's one of the ones I like a lot too. Yeah. It's a good one. Well, um, I know that, so the album came out in June, right? Hmm. And um, you've, have you, you, you were out of the country. Was that touring for this? That was, no, that was actually with my family. We took oh. a, a vacation. That's great. <laughs> We've never <laughs> taken a proper vacation ever. And my wife and I have been married for 10 years this year. And, and uh, we thought we should do something nice for ourselves that we've never done she's always wanted to go to europe and i do have uh a tour set up for europe for later in the fall and i'm actually working to start uh going there sort of regularly you know once a year twice a year i'm hopeful to because i really want to i want to build it up over there and uh and uh, i thought you know kim's never been to europe and i'm going to be going a lot and we never even really took a honeymoon. We got married in New Orleans and had a, a big weekend with all my family there. And it was mm-hmm. such a blast. And it almost was like a honeymoon itself. And we just kind of got back home and got back to life. And we never took one. So, and my son loves Bach. Our son loves Bach. And uh, I thought, well, I'm going to be playing in Germany in the fall. And wouldn't it be great if if somehow we could take him over there and he could see like where Bach grew up and where Bach's buried and all that. So we did all that. And uh, so that was fun, but um, I am going to be there in the fall for about two and a half, three weeks playing and um, still filling out the calendar for the rest of this year in this country. Um, yeah. uh, I should have some dates announced within the next couple of weeks. Cool. Um, cool. And then hopefully next year I'll be out, um, a lot. I'm hope I want to take this record out to as many people as I can. 
how can, what's the best way for people to follow you and stay updated on your tour dates and everything? Is that your website or socials or both? Uh, I post the dates all on my website, which is just davidnewbold.com. And, um, and then, you know, I just post posts about when I have shows or I'll be posting all the European dates when they're all finalized. Cause that'll be an actual tour, you know, so be posting all the states, but the website and then, and then, um, my, my uh, Instagram and Facebook pages, always, whenever I have something going on, I speak about them there. Awesome. Well, we encourage everybody who's listening to Americana Station and who is um, uh, enjoying Powered Up and whether or not you're a veteran listener of David Newbold or you are just discovering, um, just, you know, give him a follow on the socials and check in with his website because he will He'll be on the road. And um, as a person who has seen this show, <laughs> I encourage you to to um, to partake because it was a really, really fun night over at D's. And I appreciated being involved by accident. Well, yes. Can I just go on record and saying I was blown away by what you did that night when you got up? Because, you know, uh, for anyone listening, yeah, we we. Uh, I had a number of friends come up to guest that night and um, one of my friends and I were going to do the Tom Petty and Stevie Nicks duet, stop dragging my heart around. And at the 11th hour, um, she was unable to make it due to a family situation. So um, our mutual friend, uh, Patrick Patrick was going to be there. And I mentioned this to him. Why did I, I think I asked if, I don't know, but he said that you were going to be there. And he would see if you want to do it. And I thought, great, that would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> really, really cool. And then you got up there and, and uh, as soon as you opened your mouth, you just, just killed it. I mean, <laughs> it was just, that was just amazing. I was, that was so much fun. <laughs> it was super fun. And usually, uh, usually I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a little keyed up as a, sort of my default setting. <laughs> and so usually I'm like, Oh no, like I don't want to jump in and do that. But like, um, I don't know. Like I was, I was feeling adventurous that day. So I just jumped up and did it. And I'm so glad I did. Cause it was really fun. And you and your band sounded so good. And, um, and like John bird got up there with you all to play. And I swear, like that was probably some of the most fun I've had in a long time was listening to y'all do Tulsa time with John. Bird. Oh, I always <laughs> say I, I, I want to be John bird when I grow up. I just, I just love that guy. I think that's a good goal. Like I, I kind of uh, want to be John Bird too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Fun night. I'm glad was. you were there. Thanks for coming. And thanks so much for having me on this and, and uh, asking all these thoughtful questions. I really enjoyed talking about it. Talking well, to you. I've enjoyed talking to you and um, we'll have to, we'll have to do more stuff and talk some more. And yeah. um, thank you for taking, you know, an hour out of your day to, talk with me for Americana station and um, thanks to Will Payne Harrison for Americana station being a thing. So (laughs) thank you, Will. (laughs) Yeah. Well, take care and I wish you all the best and all like all good things for this album because it's, it's a good one. It's really good. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good day. I'm not alone, alone, alone. I've got a million.